Welcome to the What's Under the Hood podcast. And uh, my name is Rick Maltese. I'm the host. And I have with me Chris Adlam, Piero Franta, and Tom Hess. And we're all going to be discussing the can do in general and perhaps more specifically about Pickering. But we, we can sort of skip around and talk about uh, even the decommissioned ones if you want. <laughs> but uh, okay, so. Um, so yeah, just to get started, let's get some people's background. I, I kind of uh, wanted to, Yarrow to start explaining his background first. And um, if you don't mind, just to give us a, some, like where did you work and where did you grow up and all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, I uh, retired from AECL, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, in August 2011. So that's 12 years ago. <laughs> And uh, so I worked, uh, originally I started with AECL in Chalk River in Ontario. And then I found out that they have an office in Quebec, in Montreal, uh, which is where I normally live. So I transferred to the Montreal office. That was after I also worked uh, for a short time uh, at Pickering on the refurb project there. But once I was in, in the Montreal office, I worked mostly on the Jean C. E. Two can do plant, various aspects of that. Jean C. E. Two is uh, situated across the Saint Lawrence River from Trois Rivières, three rivers. Uh, but we also had other projects uh, for Chalk River and um, and elsewhere. Uh, also the advanced can do. Basically what happens is in the Montreal office, uh, we got all sorts of stuff that none of the other AECL offices wanted to do. <laughs> okay, we can discuss some of that uh, if you like later. Okay, sure. Okay, yeah, uh, how about you, Chris? Well, um, <laughs> I actually work in the IT industry and in, in healthcare specifically. Uh, I got interested in nuclear power uh, when the GEA started uh, messing up rates in Ontario and was being blamed on nuclear. And I did some deep diving into that and realized that was complete nonsense. Um, uh, in terms of an engineering background, uh, my grandfather is an engineer in hydroelectric at, um, at GE here in Peterborough, uh, as was his father, Hubert Sills, uh, who owned, they had a ton of patents uh, oh, yeah. and various hydroelectric stuff uh, and participated in um, many of our massive hydro buildouts here, both in Ontario and Quebec and, uh, and abroad. Okay, yeah. And Tom, what do you want to say? Oh, hello. <laughs> well, as Rick uh, mentioned, the name is Tom Hess, and uh, I work in the electricity industry, or used to. Actually, I still do do some contracting work right now. But I started with Ontario Hydro back in 1975. Um, at the time, I lived in Cambridge, Ontario, and started moving around the province uh, as an operator, started uh, off in Hamilton, worked in Toronto, up to North Bay, over to London, Ontario, and then back to Toronto. So I've got uh, hands-on experience with the distribution system uh, equipment, you know, just the poles and wires that you have around the streets, and then the high voltage uh, equipment, so the big transmission towers uh, crisscross the province. Mm -hmm. uh, when I worked in North Bay, I had hands-on uh, experience operating hydroelectric plants, uh, both small, old, and large, new. And, uh, well, from London, then I was a traveling operator there. In uh, 1980, I started working in the Ontario Hydro System Control Center. So basically a grid operator. Okay. Um, and that involved everything at that time. Of course, Ontario Hydro was vertically integrated, so you did everything from operating the transmission system to planning river system water flows and, um, you know, directing the generation up and down, doing the balancing, doing sales and purchases with other uh, interconnections and that sort of stuff. Do most grid operators like nuclear power? 
Well, they love it. <laughs> oh, good to know. It's like the cruise control on your car. You set it and forget it. Right? It <laughs> takes care of so much of the demand. Just sits there uh, <laughs> generating power nonstop. And I know people try to make fun of it. Oh, is it really 365, 24 7? You know, because every so often the equipment fails and the unit goes off. And then you get the, uh, oh, the yeah. people saying, well, it's not really dispatchable and it's not there 365 days a year, but it is. <laughs> you know, that's the intent of it. Actually, they try to uh, have it there for three years at a time. And one of our generators managed to do that a while ago. Oh, yeah. so. It's a, it's a really good power source. I, I grew to love it when I when I worked at the control center. Okay. Um, do you have one of those? They call them iron rings. I think you wear it on your pinky. No, that's for engineers. That's for engineers. Okay. I I went to Ontario Hydro straight out of high school, and all my knowledge is uh, basically on at work experience. I'm probably just as good as an engineer, if not better. I wouldn't be surprised because, because we had to. Uh, apply everything that they came up with and morph it to actually what worked on the system and actually spot problems and, and deficiencies in what they provided us. So it's a, it's an all well-rounded experience base. Okay. You know, the, uh, my certification was a, a certified uh, um, grid operator in the reliability field. So and that was a NERC certification. So we were certified, but that was more or less my post-secondary education. Okay, yeah. So, and uh, about those about those rings, um, yes, uh, many many engineers get them, but it's not obligatory. What's what really counts is not it's not the ring, it's the it's the stamp, it's the uh, what do you, what do they call it? The um, order of uh, engineers stamp, the seal. Yes, if you. If, that's what you gotta have to cert to certify documents, official documents, drawings, and stuff like that. Okay, kind of like a badge of honor. Well, no, it certifies it certifies that the documents that you are issuing uh, are uh, are either prepared by or reviewed by uh, a professional engineer, which is what I was when I. Uh, before I retired, and, and that's an important point. It's it's um, this business of the order of engineers is similar to what you have among, let's say, uh, medical doctors. They they are members of a medical order, and and if they're not, they they can't practice. Okay, yeah. So I want to get down to this, the talking about the can do, and. Um... I just wanted to read something because I, I like this comment and it talks about the power behind reactors in general. And I think the can do, of course, is belongs in that category. This is a, this was a guy called um, Colin Tucker and uh, he wrote a book called How to Drive a Nuclear Reactor. And he says, if you're driving a modern PWR at steady output, you'll have as much power at your fingertips as 40 fully laden 747 aircraft taking off simultaneously. And uh, I thought that was pretty amazing to demonstrate what kind of power is conducted by these reactors at one time. And uh, I guess that would be a combination of reactors, that kind of power. It wouldn't be just one reactor, right? Um, does that make sense to you? Um, I think a jet engine might be something or the, or on the order of 10 megawatts thermal. So if you're, uh, if, if you have a can do, which is, let's say, uh, 700 megawatts electric, which is what, uh, 2,500 thermal, you're talking about an awful lot of jet engines. I think so. I think so. Yeah. So uh, that, that must've been one then. You're right. That sounds like it's just one reactor. Yeah, I just did a, a old quick Google here, and uh, one megawatt is one thousand three hundred and forty-one horsepower, uh, and you can roughly double horsepower to be pounds of thrust. So, yeah, if yeah. you want a reactor, okay. And I thought that was, uh, you know, I mean, 
Also, the other the other weird thing that just totally struck me is how much water actually runs through a reactor in a given second. For the you know how it's just enormous. People don't realize the kind of uh, transfer of uh, water that needs for needed for I guess for cooling and uh, other reasons. But um, transport, yeah, it's it's massive. Of the, I can't remember the exact figure off the top of my head, but they tell you when you're doing the Bruce tour. And of course, that's from four units. Yeah. And it's insane. But it's only a three degree temperature rise. So, uh, one of the reasons of moving that volume of water is to keep the temperature rise down. So, the, the inlet water and the outlet water, there's only th roughly three degrees Celsius difference between the two. Yeah, that is very small. You wouldn't expect that. Yeah. Huh. I can mention something interesting. Yeah, uh, the reason that Bruce Power does that, uh, try to keep the temperature difference so small, is because they have an environmental issue with fish in Lake Huron. And they want to make sure that that uh, temperature, local temperature, does not interfere with the breeding of the fish stocks in the lake. And this, this has been a, a subject that was covered uh, numerous times in. Uh, uh, CNSC hearings, that is public hearings of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. But uh, Yara, was that part of the reason for that, the uh, fact that the outlet channels at Bruce are shore level, unlike Darlington where it has the uh, in-lake diffuser that's like a kilometer away from the plant? Um, no, Tom? I don't think so. I think it's just, uh, you know, updated environmental requirements, okay. really. A lot of the a lot of the '80s vintage plants, like not just Ontario, everywhere, right? That didn't use cooling towers. That used once through cooling. They were all surface channels. Even when you look and see the pictures of the uh, the uh, nuclear plants in France, they, they're the same type of setup. Yeah, they have. They like have a, an outlet channel. You call it a requirement, but is it? You think it's like a a legal requirement, or just more like a? It's an environmental requirement. Yeah. So nothing to do with nothing to do with the uh, the technical aspects of the station, right? Or or regulations for that matter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're talking like the channel with the breakwaters sort of thing that you see on some of the French plants. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, you can see it when you look at look at the some of this, the the uh, like any plants, even even coal plants. Uh, a lot of them are like that. They they use the same amount of cooling water too. Good point. Exactly. And with with regard to um, how a, how a nuclear reactor works, they always talk about moderators, and I think it's worth discussing. What are the moderators on a can do? It's deuterium. What's that? It's deuterium. It's heavy water. Right, right. It's the water itself, right? But it's not just ordinary water. No, it's heavy yeah. water. And that's There's an extra hydrogen. How do you make deuterium? Uh, you operate regular water. Uh, it's kind of like a distillery. Uh, we had a massive uh, deuterium complex located at Bruce. Uh, Tom informed me it was originally fired by fossil fuels, uh, which is something I didn't know. Um, the Bruce heavy water plants uh, later on were powered by the process steam that came out of Bruce A. Uh, so Bruce A had the ability to divert um, a, a variable amount of steam uh, to a, a heat the campus, uh, B run the Bruce Energy Center, which was greenhouses and, and all sorts of uh, other processes, uh, as well as run these heavy water plants. But initially the heavy water was produced, uh, they run by uh, fossil fuels. It was coal, wasn't it, Tom? Oil. Oil. Oil fired. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. To be specific, uh, um, ordinary water that you get in a lake or a river or the ocean contains about one part in 6,000 of deuterium. So uh, that's why heavy water is so expensive because there is so little of it in the natural water, in ordinary water, and to extract it is a very difficult process, a very energy intensive process. However, the neat thing about it is that unlike uh, fuel, uh, you can keep using it and reusing it 
uh, in subsequent reactors. It, it never goes away, like, you know. That is, that's pretty good. So, except it, it can evaporate like anything else, I suppose. Yes, you can have leaks. Uh, that's one of the uh, complications of Kandu reactors is that is the heavy water management. You have to always keep worrying about where your heavy water is leaking. You have to try to capture it and to try to bring it back into the system. Typically, uh, what we do in Kandu stations is we have industrial size dehumidifiers, which capture any, uh, any heavy water that gets into the air inside the reactor building, condense it, send it back into an upgrading system, and then it goes back into the reactor. Oh, so it's considered pretty valuable. Um, it's not cheap to make then. Uh, not at all. No, it's very expensive. I think uh, if I uh, remember the cost of the total inventory of a single Kandu 6 reactors is on the order of 200 million. Have I got that right? And um, the other reason for doing all yes, and the other reason for recovering the, uh, the heavy water is because it is contaminated with tritium. So you want those uh, industrial dehumidifiers inside the reactor building to capture as much of it as possible because the heavy water is also carrying tritium. Interesting. So the, the, there's there's positive and there's negative in terms of um, the advantages of using uh, the fuel that is ne is, is um, unenriched, right? Right, right. right. Um, so unenriched fuel is cheap, but it's costly in the sense that you have to, it needs the deuterium. Yeah, it needs the heavy water. Fascinating. So then there is, also, so the moderator is uh, like natural water, uh, just regular water is only for cooling. It's not for a moderator, right? Um. No, uh, the Kandu, the standard Kandu reactors use heavy water for both cooling as well as moderation. The moderator, the moderator heavy water is maintained at a relatively low temperature, about 80 degrees Celsius inside the calandria, whereas the cooling heavy water goes through the pressure tubes where the fuel is. Okay, so you have two different heavy water systems. I'm glad you mentioned pressure tubes because that's that's the next topic. Um, uh, how, how do pressure tubes give an advantage over, say, one large pressurized container? Well, it's not really an advantage as much as it was a design choice difference. Uh, it was advantageous for Canada because we didn't have any heavy forging capacity. Uh, so rather than outsourcing that somewhere else, uh, the pressure tube design allowed us to make everything in house. And so we didn't. And so that's part of the reason that the can do supply chain is more than 95% in Canada. Uh, so there's a, a great deal of security associated with that. Um, the pressure tube design is essentially modular. Uh, you replace these pressure tubes. Uh, but as we've seen with PWRs and BWRs, the uh, the pressure vessel, which is what the uh, they use, um, originally it was expected those were only going to last 40 years, and then they discovered, well, maybe 60 years now, and now we're looking at 80 years. Um, so, and those don't require an extensive uh, core replacement, which is what we do with the Candus at 30 to 40 years, um, and, and there's a cost to that. So um, yeah, yeah. our refurbishment projects are, are essentially where, you know, that's the key component, but they do a whole pile of other maintenance activities at the same time um, because it, don't, it makes sense at that midlife uh, point to change out things like steam generators, upgrade control systems, uh, and uh, maybe swap out a turbine if it looks like that needs to be done. So you, you kind of roll all of this other work, uh, which also happens at PWR and BWRs, but it happens at different intervals. Uh, we kind of just turn it into one giant project. So is it, so is it, uh, is it also responsible for uh, this notion of being able to refuel while it's running? 
Well, that's why Darlington has 1106, or if you ask Tom, 1105 uh, days of uninterrupted generation, which it's only the data that do. says that. <laughs> I know, but OBG says it's 1106. Yeah, it's the data. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you can't do that with other designs. Right. So, being able to, to refuel online has allowed us to hold. Like the Candus have held the majority of the record run times. Uh, Darlington holds not only the longest nuclear plant run time, but the longest thermal plant run time in history, uh, wow. which, which is pretty impressive. So, so it's something to be proud of, wouldn't you say? The, that ability. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and originally, it was supposed to lead to much higher capacity factors, and it did, right? Because American reactors had to be taken offline for months at a time to be refueled, whereas the candy was just refueling online. But they got those maintenance intervals, the refueling intervals, down significantly, yeah. uh, which brought their capacity factor up. Because they're, they're refueling, it's almost once every two years, but it's not quite. It's usually 18 to 24 months somewhere in that range. Now, if you look at France, the capacity factors of the, Fran or the French fleet are, are nowhere near the U.S. capacity factors and they're nowhere near our capacity factors uh, because they have they still have very long refueling and maintenance outages. They haven't got that process you know, shrunk down and optimized like the Americans have, but they have so many units. Yeah. I, I, it's like they've just never needed to. Uh, they've, there's never been that pressure to, to optimize that process with EDF. Yeah. And um, and what about this? The whole concept of refurbishing—it's a big deal in Canada. I don't hear about other countries talking about it very much. What is it about Candus that's different? Well, they do refurbish American reactors. Uh, PWRs and BWRs do get refurbished, but it's not the same process. Uh, they'll typically, if they've got a project where, let's say, they're upgrading a generator, or maybe they're replacing the steam generators and upgrading some control systems, they'll call that a refurbishment. Okay, sure. Um, with Candus, it's a it's a very formal uh, process that happens because you're replacing pressure tubes, and that has to be done. So we tend to, as I mentioned earlier, you, we kind of roll those other tasks in with it. Uh, you know, financially, it makes more sense to do all of that at once. It's a couple billion dollars uh, per unit, roughly, uh, which seems expensive, but you know, to do, let's say Pickering, it's gonna be maybe 10 billion. Yeah, okay. It's less than half the price of building a new plant and you'll get another 50 years out of it. So it's true. It's pretty amazing. At that point, it's a bargain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's absolutely. A lot of people don't understand the numbers and the and the the duration and all that. So that's uh, it helps put it in perspective. Is it worth it? Are you getting your money back? And um, certainly are right. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of the things as we're seeing with Bruce is that when they get refurbished, they, the operation performance improves significantly. Bruce is the best. Uh, Bruce A units one and two have the highest capacity factor in our fleet at 93%. Uh, I think for that one's for Bruce one and Bruce two is like 92.5. Um, so these, these are world class uptimes. And now Bruce is operating all of the units. So they are adding the equivalent of an, another entire reactor to the site just through improving the output of these units. So they're going to be north of seven gigawatts, wow, which yeah. is incredible. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to offset the loss of, of Pickering A units one and four uh, when they retire next year. I see, uh, yeah, Bruce has been sort of um, neck and neck with other, uh, other nuclear plants in terms of the biggest in the world. Yeah, there's there there's the uh, plant in Japan that shut down okay. that has a higher name cape, nameplate capacity, yeah. uh, and then there's a plant in South Korea that has a higher nameplate capacity because they just brought another unit online. Mm -hmm. um, though they are going to be retiring one of the older units, I think that's Corey. Uh, they are going to be retiring one of the older units, so what that will bring that capacity down. Um, and of course, we've looked at building Bruce C. There was supposed to be a C site, 
uh, an additional four units. So if we were to add that, it would be the largest thermal plant in the world. Considering that the Americans have around 97 plants now, nuclear plants, yeah. and we have, uh, well, we have four basically, right? And um, so... But a lot of the unit, the American plants, a lot of the American plants are like single unit. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Whereas ours are all, well, multi all of the ones in Ontario are multi-unit. Yeah. Uh, so I guess what I'm getting at is there's some explanation on why Canada has made, like we had, we even had the biggest coal plant in North America for a long time. Well, this is Tom's ballpark here. This is all Ontario Hydro. Yeah, is it? <laughs> yeah. So can you explain why why Canada would have the biggest coal plant or some of the biggest nuclear plants? Is there some logic to the to the uh, maybe the economy of the government or the government involvement? No, it's uh, <clears throat> basically the result of a vertically integrated utility. You had much the same process uh, happening like uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, oh. maybe to a slightly lesser extent. Um, but Ontario Hydro started building plants and they would build them in unit pairs. So even when you get uh, to the Hearn plant, for instance, I, I won't bother with the, the Windsor plant, the Keith plant, it was fairly small, but Hearn, it was built uh, two units at a time. And the first four units were only 100 megawatts. The second four were 200 megawatts. So that plant ended up with eight units in there. When they started building Lakeview, again, unit pairs, they started off with the building two units Units, then they added two more, and then they added four more, and that became an eight-unit plant. And Nanacoke uh, ended up uh, going the same way. Um, it was being built about the same time the Lambton coal plant in Sarnia, or just south of Sarnia. The Lambton plant stopped at four units. They didn't go to eight units here, but the Nanacoke plant did. And it was actually larger than the 4,000 megawatts. Um, originally, when it was designed, it was designed to, to use... Um, basically coal from West Virginia, high sulfur coal. Those units were 550 megawatt units. And then when the environmental restrictions started uh, getting into there, they had to go to low sulfur blends, and that actually restricted the capability of the units just slightly under 500 megawatts apiece. Okay. And... and just getting a little bit sidetracked, but it was a weird factor there. The uh, the electrostatic precipitators, which take the uh, ash out of the uh, the uh, exhaust or effluent, whatever you want to call it, the smoke, um, they're much more effective when they have high sulfur content. They actually attracted the particulates much easier. So, um, you know, it actually increased the particulate pollution out of the units, and so they had to throttle them back. So, but that's how it ended up being a plant like that. That's how Pickering ended up at uh, eight units as well. Um, so you economies know. of scale has something to do with it. And what about that and transmission? Um, yeah. Ontario Hydro was big at building a transmission corridor. So you just don't just have one transmission tower line running um, from one uh, location in the province to another. You have a number of them, two, three, four. Now, do we have you know, a, do we have a bidding process for for uh, for our grid? Like, I know the Americans do. You'll hear a lot of people saying that we don't have a running market, but the whole market dispatch runs on a machine on a computer, and it decides mathematically on the offers that are put into the system on what to dispatch, and that's how it gets dispatched. Okay, and we do this. We don't do this. Well, like we, they talk about after reading <laughs> Meredith Angwin's book. Um, you, you've probably heard about uh, her book. Uh, she talks about um, about uh, the bidding process and how it can um, how they treat basically wind and solar and gas as as equals, and uh, which is kind of not true of their performance capabilities, right? So do we do that in Canada? Well, what do you mean by gas is equal? Well, equal in the sense uh, that it's, it's really not as equal. It's, just, it's not dispatchable, right? Gas is dispatchable. Wind and solar are not. Gas is dispatchable. Yeah. Yeah. They're treated much the same way here in Ontario. Um, they, they get a certain amount of money um, 
you know, per megawatt hour that they produce. Even when they're curtailed, they get paid. I think it's a slightly smaller rate, but not by much. And when they first came on the grid, they were actually forcing the nuclear units to back off. But that has a cost. You're starting to dump steam into condensers. You're starting to put more heat into the lake. In the meantime, all these wind turbines are spinning, um, just pushing you into nuclear costs because it's eroding the steam condensers that are at the plants. You know, the fish are getting, well, there, there are the temperature restrictions, so they're not getting warmer water, but they're getting lots more warm water, put it that way, because it's flowing through through the plant faster. Okay. So Ontario decided, you know what, um, operationally and uh, environmentally, it made more sense to allow the nuclear units to stay loaded and curtail the wind. So you just shut the wind turbine off. So they're not spinning. They're not chopping up the odd bird here or there or bat. And on top of that, it's extending the life of those facilities because they're not running, right? They're not wearing out. So yeah. it's it's a win all the way around. And they're so easy to dispatch. You just switch them on and off, the individual wind turbines. So you can uh, you know, easily dispatch them as long as you have the fuel available there. So within the available wind, they're quite easily dispatched. So how, do, how does, uh, like, before wind and solar came along, we had nuclear reactors, and we had um, quite a manageable um, grid, uh, at least as far as I understand. But something happened um, that made um, that, that management change because of um, un unpredictable elements, right? Wind and solar introduced... Uh, where where we had to start bypassing the steam in the in the reactors, is that something that was always done, or is that some more more of a modern phenomenon? There there were periods where you had excess power, where you had to uh, throttle back the nuclear plants. But back in the nineties, when we had the the eight Bruce units on eight Pickerings, and the four Darlingtons came on, and you had the big recession in ninety two. Um, overnight was a big problem, and every night you'd be backing off the nuclear units. Yeah, because you don't. And they would. Yeah, what's, and they would do that on reactor power. What's the difference? You had or like approximate percentage of drop in an evening. Well, it, it would all depend on how much you need. Yeah, so so there there was various factors, and on top of that, at that time, it was still vertically integrated, so you could do command and control, which means you could dovetail the hydroelectric generators into what you were doing with the nuclear units and actually run them hard during the day to get as much water out as you can and then uh, store as much as you could overnight, which you can't do under a market system. If anyone's just, driven from... Just doesn't If work. you've ever driven from the United States to Canada so along the highway, Ways. When you reach Canada, you notice a major difference. You see the highways are lit up like crazy. You actually can see your way around. In the United States, you're driving on a highway, and you all you see is reflectors the whole way to keep yourself lined up on the road, right? Uh, so, so we have a tremendous amount of energy, but we have the highways are lit up, and we see we go into the city of Toronto, and the the buildings are turned on at night. Um, so let me finish off about talking about the nuclear units and how they moved. Sure. Um, back in the 90s, they did it in reactor power, and they'd have two two modes of reduction on them, what they called a shallow maneuver and a deep maneuver. And a deep maneuver you could only do once or twice a week. The shallow maneuver you could almost do every night. And every evening, the, the, the um, operators would tell you how much they can do based on what the reactor physics were doing at the time. So shallow maneuver was anywhere... Yeah, from 20 to 40 megawatts per unit. The deep maneuvers were up to 150, 200 megawatts down. Basically, the, the biggest maneuvers were right down to the 60, 65 percent reactor power, which is sort of the maintenance level for the reactor. After that, it starts, the reaction starts dying off if they get below that. Um, 
so we were doing that. The difference now is the uh, the units don't maneuver on reactor power anymore, so that's why you get into the dumping into the steam condensers. And those were originally put in the units. Again, if you lose the direct generator for some reason, you know you can have uh, the loss of the generator. It trips off due to an electrical disturbance or a problem with the generator that's easily fixed. And the can-dos were designed to set the reactor back to 60, 65 percent reactor power and use these condensers to keep the reactor running. So when you did your quick fix in the generator, they could come right back on rather than having to wait two days to start up the reactor again. Mm -hmm. And that's where these condensers came from. And now we're using them for, for excess to actually dump steam into them with the unit, with, with the generator on to reduce the megawatts in the generators. So that's what they're doing with those now. They weren't actually installed to do this um, reduction. They were they were installed to uh, maintain the reactor while the generator was off. Yeah, Bruce calls it flexible output now. Uh, it got a, it's got a branding <laughs> term to it. But uh, per Tom's point, uh, if I was reading one of the history documents on uh, basically the turning up of the Bruce site and what was going on there, uh, and transmission disruptions were uh, quite common uh, in the early days of the Bruce site. And so one of the design parameters for that location was to simply to have these units uh, have this these flexible characteristics. Um, so yeah, bypass into the condenser um, to immediately drop uh, electrical output. Um, and then uh, I believe what Tom was describing, I think you referred to them uh, as step backs or setbacks to me, right? At one point, yeah, it's a step uh, back. Deep in the shallow maneuvers. Yeah. Um, so you um, well, no, th those those terms are for automatic operations. Oh, okay. Um, they they just called it uh, a maneuver, reactor okay. maneuver. But actually, the technical uh, re requirements of a new maneuver involves uh, the um, the control rods. No, they're, they're just straight steam. The current maneuver is just oh, okay. straight steam. Yeah. Oh, even it can dump up to twenty four hundred megawatts at the Bruce site. Okay, so two point four gigawatts uh, is the capacity. They could they can technically do it on all eight units. Mm -hmm. So they offer it up as up to twenty four hundred megawatts of flexible capacity. I don't think we've ever done all eight units. That would that's a ton of heat being rejected into the lake. Um, but that's how it's how it's sold. Um, and we, as Tom noted, we used to do that. That, uh, to allow wind on the grid. So, you know, it's three in the morning, the demand's really low, wind shows up, and we're dumping steam at, at Bruce. So we, we stopped doing that process. Um, so now we spill hydro instead. <laughs> what, what you will find, though, when you get down into curtailing the wind generation, the market can't do it anymore. Yeah. So as far as I know, I don't know this directly, but I think the operators at the IESO will direct specific wind farms to reduce various amounts of megawatts. And while they're down in that mode, the wind, as I mentioned before, is actually on dispatch. That's what they're dispatching up and down to follow the load. So you will have a little bit of wind still loaded when the uh, nuclear units start reducing on their curtailment because the uh, ISO operators are still using the wind to do the minute-to-minute -minute dispatch. So minute-to-minute -minute dispatch with wind is sort of a contradictory statement. Like, how do you dispatch wind? Because you've dispatched it down, you have more wind available than what you're using. So the fuel is there. You can you can start them up. You can shut them down. They're on dispatch. I don't call it curtailment at all. I call it they're on dispatch. Yes. When you think about it, um, say Costa Rica, which is basically all hydroelectric. Do you think they use every ounce of water that they have? No. You know, their system, the generators go up and down, and when they can't use the water, they're dumping it past the dam. I see. And it's on dispatch. It's not curtailed. It's on dispatch. That's that's what the demand, they, they can only supply as much as demand that's there, right? Yeah. Anything extra really is not needed. So it's not really curtailed because there's no use for it. You just bypass. So I guess you could say that it's, it's only dispatchable to a point, and then if there's no wind, you're in trouble. No, well, then you get into the hydroelectric. <laughs> and the hydroelectric, the market can dispatch it because it has a price. Because in, in Ontario, 
water costs money. There's a water rental fee on water. There isn't on air, there isn't on photons, but there's a water rental fee on water, which means the first hydroelectric units that come up cost like two or three dollars a megawatt hour, and then it goes up to about the seven, eight dollar range for some, and then you get up into the fifteen dollar range, and at the top end, the big plants cost thirty dollars a megawatt. It, it's actually more expensive than gas at times because natural gas is so cheap. Wow. So don't think of water as free in Ontario. It's not. It costs money. <laughs> okay. No, we, we pay for that when we spill it, though, too, don't we? Um, I believe so. Now, there's a certain amount of water that has to run. The baseload water, it comes in at zero dollars. There is a water rental fee charged for it, but they can't dispatch it. So you'll see roughly 3,000 megawatts of water running when you're into these modes. And that's what confuses people when they're looking at the Ontario market. They scratch their heads and they say, what the heck's going on here? Because the price is zero, the water's running, the wind's down. Now we're getting nuclear units down. And yeah. it gets even more complicated when they have to get gas uh, plants started up. They come into that zero cost regime too, coming up to minimum load. And you're still in that mode of dispatching with the, with the wind generation at zero dollars. Now, of course, the uh, the wind turbines do have an impact on the market rate. Like today, it was windy and we had low demand and it was half a cent a kilowatt hour on the market. Yep. And of course, they're, got, they're not being paid half a cent because even though, as you mentioned, that the, the market dispatch and the, and the prices we're seeing on the market because everything's on fixed rate contracts, you know, they're getting the 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, yeah, but the dispatch price is close to zero, and that's what the dispatch tool dispatches to. Yeah. It doesn't care about these background costs. No. And, and that's what people have to get in their heads. Uh, the market in Ontario is dispatched by a machine. The operators, they only intervene for security and emergencies. Other than that, it's a computer doing the dispatching. Yeah. And Ontario Hydro was, was significantly more efficient than this process, correct, with the vertical integration? Oh, yeah, because uh, he, he dovetailed everything together. Um, in a market, everything that goes in there is one-hour blocks. Uh, just, you know, I want to know about this uh, computer doing the work. Like, um, the computer has to alert an operator, right? It doesn't simply turn on a machine for you, does it? It sends out the dispatches. The operators monitor it, and they'll intervene when they have. So they respond. But every five computer. every five minutes, yeah. it calculates and sends out the next target to all the generators. But it's still operator control. Like so, they have to respond to what the computer supervised. Tells. Supervised. Okay. Supervised. At the other end, the, most of the plants now are automated. It, they get a number where they're supposed to go to, and their computers take the unit to wherever it's supposed to go to. Oh, okay. And, and we're living in a very technical age. And the supervision we need a lot of IT people. The, super, <laughs> the supervision must include little warning signals, uh, parameters when it reaches past a certain point, you get an alert. Those kind of things. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. The guy can the the operator like at the ISO can intervene. He can block the whole dispatch. He can block individual dispatches to units. He can send out manual dispatches which is what I think they end up doing when they're in, into the wind generators or sending out manual dispatches. Interesting. I think. I'm not, I'm not positive on that, but there's, there's no price driver for the tool to dispatch to because it's sitting at a flat zero, zero dollars a megawatt hour. So it That's great. Um, doesn't know I, what to I do. I appreciate your expertise. <laughs> I, I, I want to um, get back to the, the concept of what makes, what's under the hood. <laughs> and, yep. uh, I wanted to read something uh, because um, I think it, it comes from a textbook that actually Yarrow gave me the name of. I believe it was Yarrow. It was the, it was called the Essential Can Do, and uh, it just speaks to something that I think needs to be addressed. Uh, I'll just read it right now. It says heat is generated in the nuclear reactor, and electricity is produced by the electrical generator. 
the production and discharge of this energy must be perfectly balanced. The steam generator is the key component for maintaining this balance. That is, the rate of steam generation must match the rate of steam flow to the steam turbine or vice versa. Any change in these two energy flows will immediately be reflected as a change in steam pressure in the steam generator. Therefore, steam pressure, sorry, therefore, steam pressure is a key control parameter for the entire plant under all operating conditions. So, um, so that's uh, kind of interesting. So I, I asked the question, is this dependent on maintenance or how much of, is it a balancing act by a machine or by operator? Is the operator making these uh, adjustments if, when necessary? Well, when it's just sitting there running along, it's a machine doing it on its own computers. Okay. It does it all on its own. The operators will give the uh, reactor manual instructions. Okay. Yeah. So if you want it to go up, go down, they, they can they can dial a uh, change the reactor power manually. But normally the can do units now run on the turbine following the reactor, what they call reactor leading, which means the reactor does its thing and the turbine control systems follow whatever the reactor is delivering to keep that balance in place. Wow, yeah. Okay, that's pretty neat. It's minor fluctuations. When when you look at the outputs of the can do units, you know, they're they're only moving around one or two megawatts. Now you'll see uh, drifting going on and outputs from hour to hour if the reactor is changing a little bit. And that's due to the physics of the reactors. Sometimes they have a little bit of an issue where they have to manually adjust the reactor down or they can adjust it back up. But when you look at a, a generator on the system that's running automatically with the reactor running at full, ignoring limitations that they might have on the reactor. It's it's running at its full capability. The output of those generators is pretty steady. Like, I mean, the very, the, the um, variability of the output of the turbine tr uh, trying to balance the steam process is very small. You know, only a megawatt or two. Um, an operator needs to be alert, I suppose, right? They can't fall asleep on the job. No. <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> they have a lot of things to monitor. You're watching these things, just like the pilot in the cockpit of an airplane. Yeah. I mean, the airplanes fly themselves for the most part. They can even take off and land on their own yeah. if they let them, but the pilots don't like to do that. Like They like to manually take off and land, but as soon as they get in the air, even while the landing gear is coming up, they're already switching on the autopilot and the machine's doing the whole driving until they get to the final final parts of the landing process and it's the same for these uh, nuclear units same thing there's yeah there's a degree yeah, fly by wire i guess fly and of course the pilots wire. are watching all the time yeah make sure everything's running right and it's the same with the operators in a nuclear plant and the grid operators as well and, and, and the market operators running the markets are watching the thing do now, thing, now the and they're ready to intervene now the self-driving car too uh they, bill gates did a little thing where he's he gets into a cab and it's uh self-driving and they have a, a woman sitting at the wheel but she's not moving the wheel she's there just in case she's yeah. needed I, <laughs> so yeah um, so right. it's the same thing it's just it's uh yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering. I've never been involved in in um, can do uh, plant operations, uh, so I was, this is a curious point for me uh, to uh, ask about. Maybe somebody can answer. I would expect some of those minor variations in the reactor power output to be due to ongoing fueling operations, because these go on all the time. So, you know, uh, might make a difference, uh, maybe a few hundred kilowatts here and there as, as the fuel bundles are changed out, right? Uh, am I correct in that? Um, that's right. You can watch uh, that, that process in, in 
really vivid action at Pickering 8. They seem to have uh, quite a few issues where the fueling stops and the output of the unit starts fading. And they'll, they'll drift down over a couple of days from their full output down to 450, 400 megawatts till they get the fueling process starting again. But what you got to keep in mind, though, this, this balance in the unit itself, the steam, steam energy balance, the generators can go from full to zero on, on, the, on the steam valves in a matter of seconds, probably in a, in a second, right? So it's really not any effort at all for the generator to respond to an increase or decrease in the steam that's being sent to it. You know, the candy units have another mode called uh, reactor following the turbine. And Bruce actually used to use that when the transmission was limited and they were up against the transmission limits. Because you'd have you'd have like a 5,000, 5,500 megawatt limit of the flow out of the complex, and you're running within 20, 30 megawatts of this limit, and you can't have the um, generators moving up and down with what the reactors want to do. You have to actually have the reactors fine tune themselves to what you wanted the turbine to do to sit close to these limits. So, but now, as far as I know, all the all the Candu units run with the the reactor leading, the turbine following. Yeah, Tom might have been an interesting point there. So, the transmission capacity to Bruce was initially undersized. Uh, the plant was originally what six six thousand four hundred and six, I think it was sixty four forty because uh, the B units were all eight sixty. Um, but the the plant was derated, uh, but but as Tom said, the, um, the there wasn't the transmission capacity, so that wasn't fixed until twenty what was it twenty eleven with the Milton line, yeah, uh, which is when they added. And it was funny because the Ontario Clean Air Alliance was like, "Oh, there's no point in building the Milton line because the Bruce units are going to be shut down in 2016." And of course, that never came, <laughs> never happened. <laughs> Is ridiculous, but uh, yes, there. I think there's about it's either 7,500 or eight gigawatts um, of capacity of transmission capacity there now, which is great now that they're looking to actually increase the output of the site even further. And what accounts for that difference? They've added more lines, or, or are you talking about the uprates? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, the uprate, yeah. Uh, well, first off, they're pulling the D rate, or they're planning on pulling the D rate, they haven't pulled the D rate yet. Um, in the 90s, there were some concerns about the if there was a large uh, fuel channel break at Bruce, a large loss of cooling incident, uh, how quickly the unit could be shut down uh, because it only has a single coolant loop. So you would you could potentially lose up to half the coolant in the unit. Darlington has two loops, so you could only ever lose up to 25% of the coolant. So it's not, not as much of an issue, uh, or it wasn't seen to be an issue at Darlington or at Pickering. So this is a Bruce-specific issue. Um, the other issue is, of course, that Bruce has the highest thermal capacity of any of our units. Uh, so they have the potential to make the most power. Uh, so that kind of compounded the problem. So the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission originally limited them to 60% reactor power, then they bumped that up to 70%. Um, and then there were some revisions made and improvements. Um, they changed the direction of fueling. Uh, they dropped the number of bundles down, if I remember correctly. They were originally 13, and they dropped down to 12, which is the same as Darlington. Um, and there were some other mitigation schemes put into place that uh, eventually allowed the power to creep up to where it is right now, uh, which is, I think, 93.5% for the A units and 94% for the B units. Yeah. Um, so the B units make about 825 approximately, and we're now seeing 825, 826, 828 out of uh, units one and two at Bruce A, they're running a higher D rate and they're producing more power. Uh, so the limit will be the generator. Um, but if you if you take that number and you kind of turn it into a ratio, uh, you can get a rough idea of what the unit should make with the D rates pulled. And it should be around 890 megawatts. Um, so, you know, assuming the A units don't quite have the headroom that the B units have, let's say, you know, they run out a generator at 880 or something like that. 
um, and the B units have more headroom because they were originally 860. Um, you know, you're looking at almost 7,100 megawatts. This gets to my next question because there's a kind of a gray area when you're discussing what makes a plant live longer. Like um, mm -hmm. I say, how do the new designs for the can do? Oh, I have a slide for that. Uh, <laughs> how do they make it the, them last longer uh, than 30 years? Um, so we're talking about some of the same things, aren't we? The upgrades? No. no? Um, I mean, yes and no, I guess. Uh, for the candies, once you replace the pressure tubes, you, you essentially double the life. But it's not really that simple because the new pressure tubes are better than the old pressure tubes. Um, and I have a screen share for the Oh, yes, very good. Second yeah. uh, so this is a pressure tube evolution. So you can see Pickering, Bruce, Darlington, early C6s, cold work ZR 2.5 MB, right? Yeah. And then you can see the current Candu 6 with low H and CL. And then you have the new one, the ACR cold work. So this is sort of the evolution, evolutionary process um, of, the, of the pressure tubes. They've gotten better. And if I switch to this one. What period of time do those represent? Uh, I don't know, the current one, is I think we're on like generation six or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, so like the current pressure tubes were expect like the ones in Darlington, right? So you're talking late eighties, early nineties. Oh, okay. Those were expected to last um, thirty, roughly thirty years. Okay. Yeah. So this is and, this represents the whole history of the Candu, pretty much. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically, or, or that in that design. Okay. Um, yeah, I see it. Okay, so you can see hydrogen uptake. And you can see how with the, the original Zerk Alloy 2, it was very quick. <laughs> and then you can see how much slower it is with the current Candu 6, the ZR 2.5 NB. So this has been improved even more. Those, what are those bottom units there? Oh, that's the uh, that's my the years oh, wanting to change. Years. Yeah, time and years. Oh, okay. So, the, in speaking to one of the operators at Darlington, um, it was posited that we may get thirty-five to forty years out of the new alloy. So again, this brings back the whole better than new with the refurb because you know with a, with a new unit you have teething pains, right? Like we've seen with uh, with OL three in Finland, um, like we're going to see at Vogel. You don't have that with a unit that's mature because you know it's quirks. There's one of the Darlington units, or is it one of the Pickering units, Tom's that vibrates? It's one of the Pickering units, Pickering five, isn't it? Number five, yeah. Yeah. So you know they have these quirks, and you know you're very you have this intimate uh, familiarity with the unit uh, and how it works, and you know what works best. So you you keep all of that with the refurbishment. You know the unit is already optimized. Uh, your operation of it is already optimized, but you're replacing key components with better components. So it's a, and that you know it's just a very good alloy of some kind. Well, the, the, that's just the, with the pressure tubes. Yeah, it's a better alloy uh, yeah. with with these new pressure tubes. But I'm think, talking about the unit as a whole. Mm -hmm. Like we saw with Bruce units one and two, the the upgraded control systems and the changes they made there dramatically increased the capacity factor of those units. They just, they just don't have the downtime that the other units have. So you get those improvements as, as part of this process. And so not only are you getting better pressure tubes, you're getting higher unit output and better reliability. And um, so that brings us to another interesting little uh, quirk, and that's this lovely sheet. Can you see that one? Yeah. Um, okay, Darlington, it talks about all the different units in Darlington and Pickering. Members. Yeah. So this, so uh, if we're going to specifically talk about Pickering for a minute, we might as well. Um, so with Darlington, the 30 years ended up being about right. 
as you can see with Darlington Unit 1, right? You got 212,000 full power hours, 114 ppm ATQ, right? The limit's 120. Mm -hmm. And they're figuring it was going to hit that around 229,000 full power hours. Should probably roughly. expand on what HEQ is. Yeah. Oh, hydrogen, hydrogen equivalent concentrations. The amount of, of hydrogen uptake that the pressure tube. Yeah. Uh, the hydrogen during is, service. It's like a pro, it's an un, unwanted product, hydrogen. No, it's hyd well, I guess it is, but it causes embrittlement. It's basically pressure tubes are very ductile. And as they pick up hydrogen, they become more and more brittle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you remember, you remember the chart we were just looking at, and it had that really quick increase in that that earlier alloy. Sure. That was actually the the tube alloy that uh, that was associated with the uh, the break in the Pickering two unit back in the eighties. Oh, okay. yeah. When they had the loss of coolant leak. Interesting. And that was due to hydrogen uptake that causes brittle spots in the tubes, and then you get cracking. And that one, well, there was a couple of factors. Factors too. There, there was um, the annual spacers. The, yeah, the the pressure the pressure tubes sit in the uh, the fuel channel, which in the, is a sort of an external tube around it. That's a shield, and there's spacers in there to keep the two separate. And the spacers had actually moved, and the pressure tube was touching the calandria tube, so it was causing even more issues there. But that's that's the one that. Uh, caused the problem so you can see how much safer the uh, the existing pressure tubes are but they run to a hydrogen equivalent the, the limit is 120 120 parts per million we're, ta we're parts talking per about million. uh the heat the heated heavy water produces yep. hydrogen especially because of the well the, the heated heavy water and couple that with with fission yeah i think it's actually water. tritium but they call it a hydrogen equivalent yeah and so those it gets deposited. The hydrogen gets picked up and deposited, becomes part of the the alloy, and it makes it brittle, or it increases the level of brittleness. And so, the 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 model that's pursued with the candy was leak before break. Right? You you don't want the tube to split like what happened with Pickering Unit Two. Sure. You want the tube to leak first. <laughs> and so this this fracture toughness model mm -hmm. is is based on the tube leaking before it breaks. And once you hit a certain level of brittleness, the risk is that it's going to split rather than leak. So that's what establishes these limits. And these are very conservative limits, but these are have what have been established. So you look at the 120 parts per million limit, but then you go on down and you look at Pickering. And then you see that well, Pickering Unit 6 is going to have 250,000 full power hours, but it only had a hydrogen concentration of 77.6. So it had massively more hours than Darlington Unit 1, but significantly less hydrogen uptake. And this is due to the lower levels of neutron flux in the core and the fact that Pickering uses different fuel bundles. Pickering uses a 28 element bundle versus the 37 element bundle that are used in the other units. So we're talking about unit age here, and you know, you'd expect that all of the uh, units that use the same alloy would age at the same rate, but that's not true when it comes to Pickering because of these differences. So Pickering's more like a you know, 45, 50 years between refurb unit, units rather than the 30 years that we'd see with Bruce and Darlington. Um, so Pickering's somewhat unique. Yeah, Pickering is a tortoise. It'll run longer <laughs> yeah. at a lower output. And the other units are the hares, right? They run yeah. so much higher output, but a shorter life. Hmm. Yeah. So, and that comes back to economics, right? Is, is that, you know, Pickering, you're not getting as much power uh, per reactor unit as you are with Bruce and Darlington. But the flip side of that is you can run it, you know, 10, 15 years longer between refurbishments, which more than makes up for that. Right. You know, that's part, that's the logic associated with refurbishing Pickering B is that it'll outlive the other two plants. <laughs> wow. Nice. Simply because it can run so much longer on the same, on the same alloys. So when you talk about new designs of can where yeah. does that fit into the discussion? 
Well, the new design would be thir is the, e the EC6, for example, which as you saw on the previous slide, um, can do six, okay. right? And so the EC6 is an evolution of the of the can do six. It's the the current. I'm going to close this now. Um, it's the is the current export. Um, model it's what's built at kinshan in china right okay and it's just a, a more efficient uh revised version of the candu 6 which is gentili 2 uh point la pro those are both candu 6s so they took that design and they made it even more modular they optimized it um and improved things and it became the enhanced candu 6 <laughs> the ec6 um and it's designed to have a 90% capacity factor. Um, so actually slightly lower than what we're seeing with Bruce <laughs> 1 and 2. Uh, but, you know, it's supposed to be a, a very economic to build and very economic to operate modern reactor design. It's Gen 3 Plus. Uh, has a ton of passive fa safety features, but then they all do. All the Candus have a ton of passive sa safety features, um, but they're they're advertised features with with the EC6. Um, and then there's the uh, I guess the EC6 derivative or e EC6 alternative flavor, uh, the AFCR, which is the Advanced Fuel Candu Reactor, which is basically the same reactor, but vetted to run on like um mox fuel and thorium and, and and other things uh even though they all can like there there's fundamentally no real difference you could run a thorium fuel cycle in pickering if you wanted to uh yeah it brings up a good question another question i had later uh, but before i get into that question about about um Bur burning waste so that's that's gonna i'm gonna hold on to that question this this one here we're still on the enhanced uh, can do six, right? Um, yeah, the EC6. Yeah. But it's a current. It's it's licensed by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. You could build them at Darlington B tomorrow. It's our. It's already licensed in Canada. Okay, and for construction, they automatically seem to add quite a bit of uh, lifetime to the reactor. Uh, no, it's the same lifetime as Darlington. Is it? Or, like it's 30, 30 years between refurbs, so roughly a sixty-year lifespan. And how would you describe the advantages of it? Uh, it's supposed to be cheaper to operate, lower staffing. Uh, they've made improvements in certain areas, um, so less time, less less maintenance downtime. But all of these improvements are being made to Darlington and Bruce right now during the refurbishment. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier. Uh, so, so essentially, refurbing is kind of transforming them as well. Yeah, you're adding improvements. Yeah. Um, it, comically enough, the eleven hundred and five. Tom, <laughs> day run at uh, at Darlington wasn't stopped by an unplanned event. Right, right. So you could re the, you could have a car and replace the engine. I that's an exaggeration, but if you had to make some kind of analogy, you're in, you're, you're yeah. putting in an improved engine. But just just to the to that point. So Darlington Unit One ran eleven hundred and five days. Yeah. Well, eleven hundred and five days in a few hours. What stopped that, that run was a necessary hours-based maintenance outage. They had to take the unit offline to perform a test or inspect something because it hit a certain number of hours between when that test was last performed. So they hit, they hit a necessary milestone that required that unit to go off. Right. Um, that test can now be done with the unit online. Okay, cool. So there is potential for a run significantly longer than 1,105 days in the future. And I know that there, a couple of the operators are seeing that as a challenge now. <laughs> what are they going to do if they run 1,106 days in two hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just for the data, with the, the the run was eleven hundred and five days and fourteen hours. Yeah, there you go. You don't round it up. They did. <laughs> they did, but you don't round that up. You call eleven hundred and five days. Mm -hmm. That's that's where my dispute comes in. Yes, <laughs> Tom's dispute with OPG. <laughs> um, so 
you guys see some more subtlety in these things. I, I'm missing some. It's going over my head a little bit. But I'm gonna. I don't expect you to explain that. I, what I want to get into next is ex what. What is it about? Uh, burner reactors um, that is attractive, and can the CANDU be a burner reactor? Uh, you're talking about fast spectrum reactors? Well, not necessarily. Uh, being able to use waste as fuel, basically. Okay. Yeah, most of those are breeders, okay. fast spectrum reactors, which allow greater uh, utilization of, of products that can't be um, consumed in a light water reactor. Mm -hmm. Of course, can't use not a light water reactor. It's a heavy water reactor. <laughs> uh, so it has superior neutron economy um, and it can consume uh, fissile things that a light water reactor can't. Um, but you still have a waste product. Right. Um, like you can use uh, one of my favorite quotes. There was a there was a study done. I think it was McMaster, where they investigated uh, the the feasibility of doing reprocessing of candy fuel. And of course, uh, Purex, which is the uh, or Purex rather, which is the uh, uh, re reprocessing technology uh, utilized in France where they break down the, the fuel and extract the plutonium and other things um, to make fresh fuel. Well, the tailings from the enrichment process, so the, what's left over from the enrichment process has more fissile material than candy waste. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have much to work with. Uh, so the economics of reprocessing candy fuel, natural uranium fuel, where it was essentially zero. Um, but they they did pursue um, or investigate rather using uh, a novel reprocessing method using fluorine, um, which technically yielded a viable product at the end. Uh, but it was very expensive and uh, it did have much higher burn up. I think it was four times longer, uh, which is considerable. But the, the cost of fabrication um, and, and extraction were essentially insurmountable obstacles, which is why we've never uh, taken it beyond proof of concept. So, I mean, technically, yes, you could reprocess can do fuel. Would you know? Uh, Canada has so much uranium and the grade is so high. But there's some conditions. Uh, wouldn't you say that if we did have, say, an IMSR, the terrestrial energy reactor? That's again, can't, spent candy fuel is different yeah. from LWR fuel and PWR. No, no, no. So, well, I'm talking about molten salt. Yeah. Oh, I see. So it's different enough that it, it wouldn't be much good in a in a IMSR then. Yeah, the only the only reactor that's specifically focused on uh, recycling candy fuel is the Maltex design. Mm. How about um, the rest of them are all looking at LWR and BWR fuel, so slightly enriched fuel, right? I see, okay. Which see, has significantly I'm, more fissile content. I have a more practical outlook on this. Very I, I still don't no no no. I still don't understand what the benefit is of running that stuff through the Multex because right now the spent fuel bundles out of a can do reactor are self contained. Yep. They're a nice little metal module that you can easily put in a canister and put away. They're based on natural uranium. So the, the dangerous radioactivity on those decays in about four to five hundred years. Um, and they're no more dangerous than mine tailings. Um, there's not a lot of it. There's there's one hockey rink's worth, a telephone pole deep or high. I mean, you're not talking about a lot of stuff. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it seems to be point. an awful lot of effort to break up these fuel bundles, throw away 80% of what's in the fuel bundle there because you can't use it in the Multex. Run it through the Multex and get your money. Makes sense from a practical standpoint to me. I, I don't I don't know. I'm a practical person. Well, Yarrow has the, and it just, the DGR. It makes sense. I mean, we, we, you should be talking about the DGR right now, Gand, uh Yarrow. <laughs> that that's Sheila's baby. Before we do that, maybe I comment. I would I would agree with Tom on the point that he made about Maltex. Uh, if you don't mind uh, talking about that just a bit longer. 
Um, and actually, the situation is, is less attractive than Tom said. The, the amount of uh, plutonium uh, in uh, spent candy fuel, I believe, is 0.6%. And that is the fraction that Moltex want to extract to use in their reactor, molten chloride reactor. Uh, the rest goes uh, into uh, conversion into some sort of a stable form that will have to go into a DGR. There you go, there's the DGR. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. So um, there's a chloride, molten salt chloride reactor? No, no it's, it's not molten salt. Correct, yes. It is? Okay. Yes, yeah. it is. The okay. Yes, it is. Okay. They, they have a, a separate uh, salt, separate salt for the fuel, which is a plutonium chloride, and they have a, a different salt for the coolant, which is outside the fuel tubes, uh, which I believe uh, is a sodium uh, fluoride, uh, sodium chloride, or something like a sodium fluoride. Anyway, it's different from the fuel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um... So getting and yeah, per Thomas' point, I mean, you've got these can-do fuel bundles, which are all self-contained. They're not dangerous for very long because, as I noted, the can-do waste has less fissile material on it than the tailings from the enrichment process, right? So you're dealing with something that has, you know, that's not super dangerous after a reasonably short period of time, and then it, that danger drops off a cliff over a few hundred years mm -hmm. and it becomes very benign you know it's, sure. it's no more dangerous than the ore in the, that was mined in the first place mm -hmm. and it's very different from this you know this salt waste <laughs> that we don't have a storage yeah. plan for go ahead you're up yeah. if i could comment on that um the, the, the pitch that Maltex are making, or at least should be making, <laughs> because that's what their, their idea is, uh, by extracting the plutonium, which has a half-life of, what is it, 24,000 years, yeah, and fissioning it, you're basically destroying uh, the worst part of the spent fuel from Kandu fuel bundles. So, uh, you know, that's a valid point. And the other valid point, I guess, that uh, I would agree with is that uh, they're starting on the road to building, you know, fast reactors, advanced reactors. And I certainly wouldn't fault them for doing that. It's Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more in favor of that than, for instance, trying to build fusion power plants, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's my point of view anyway. Exactly, sure. Good, good point. And I have a question for you on that, Yaro. Um, so the, the waste product that we get out of the Maltex, the, the waste burner, the one that consumes the plant, the candy waste, is that at all workable with a fast reactor? Like, could you further utilize that in a fast reactor and end up with something, you know, even less dangerous? Oh, absolutely. Um, the Maltex, the initial Maltex, um, what do they call it? SSRW, uh, Stable Salt Reactor Waste. Uh, yeah, utilization. yeah, that's right, SSRW, Stable Salt uh, Waste Burner. Uh, it's strictly intended to run on uh, pure plutonium chloride fuel. But they do say that, you know, if in the future uh, anybody wanted, they could certainly include some of the uranium in the spent kind of fuel with the plutonium and uh, run it on that. It's just, you know, for some reason they, they figured they're not going to do that at the beginning. And like you say, yes, certainly the, all the rest of the uh, uranium and spent kind of fuel could be used in the fast reactor. But uh, as you also said, uh, natural uranium is a lot cheaper. And that is also, then there is also huge amounts of depleted uranium from enrichment plants. So, you know, the amount of uranium around is just mountains and mountains, and, and uh, it's sort of beside the whole point. Uh, what about the proliferation concerns? Is that the plutonium management like a, a goal because of proliferation concerns? Uh, well, there is a concern. 
question for the people who work on that issue, like Jeremy Whitlock, who works with the IAEA uh, Safeguards uh, Division in Vienna. And in fact, uh, they yeah. are involved with uh, um, developers like Multix to ensure that, uh, you know, before they even build anything, that their design meets the requirements of the safeguards. Uh, so, you know, uh, I feel that the, there is there is really uh, uh, not a public issue. It's a technical issue to be managed uh, by the people who are concerned with those issues. There's um, three of us here belong. I, I don't know if you if you're in, in, in included, Yaro, but we belong to the um, the the um, group Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Uh -huh. And um, you should join if you're not. Uh, but uh, but we've, um, for instance, we've managed to organize a, a tour of one of the reactors that Chris has taken up. Um, and uh, but um, I, I, I brought it up because uh, occasionally we have um, people chip, uh, piping in from other communities like um, Mark Nelson, uh, a couple of people from the, the uh, New York, um, uh, the, the people in New York that were uh, supportive of uh, their reactors in the shutdown of Indian Point. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess Mark Nelson made an interesting point uh, on the Decouple podcast run by, by our president of the Canadians for Nuclear Energy, Chris Kiefer. So, so he he brought up the idea that uh, molten, um, sorry that a um, can do is in effect uh, a modular large reactor. So a large modular reactor. I, I hadn't heard that term used before, and I thought that this is kind of fascinating to think that we've always had a modular reactor in a large form and um, that um, people were praising the modular reactor, but I don't even, like if you asked uh, our, our politicians if they understood <laughs> that we have modular reactors in Canada, uh, what, <laughs> is there any advantage to it? First of all, the fact if they're large and modular, they can't still they can't be put on a, a, a train the same way that a, a small modular reactor can. But the parts are replaceable. I thought maybe you could get into that discussion between the three of you. Like, um, is there an advantage to the concept well, of being modular? Let me yeah. Let me start with that. SMR is a buzzword. Everybody's SMR, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. They're in love with the term SMR. Mm -hmm. This BWRX 300 that they're building at Darlington, you can't put that on a flatbed. That's, that's your normal plant that you have to build up and build the building and put all the parts into it and that. And what, what Mark was pushing was, well, if you think these things are modular, we have big modular reactors. And he went one step further. He called the can do a modular core mod large modular reactor because <laughs> the, the core is modular right mm -hmm. every pressure tube is a module okay sure right so and he also called it immortal <laughs> yeah and, but the advantage of a module is any part that's a separate from the whole can be replaced and where a normal plant if something's wrong with the pressure vessel you have to replace the whole pressure vessel in a can-do plant, in, in the 380 channel reactors, you only got to replace one out of 380 channels. That's uh, that's a lot of. In the bigger reactors, it's one out of 480 channels. Yeah. And same, the components that go in there. I mean, they were already modular to begin with because everything's fit together, and the pipes are sort of standardized, even though they modify things here and there. And the pumps are all the same; they're all modules. The pumps plug in. You got four, eight, or 12 of the same component that all plug in together. They've always been modular. And, you know, it's it's just sort of the fight back at the small modular reactor is something magical. Well, maybe the tiny ones are, you can put them on a flatbed. Maybe the medium ones are where you have eight reactor cores in it and you can bring the eight reactor cores in on a flatbed. Mm -hmm. But geez, we've been bringing steam generators in on flatbeds into the Bruce plant for replacement. They're modules too. Oh. Like, you know, uh, so, it, must, yeah. so it, it was basically just a fight back yeah. at that. Yeah. And one of the uh, SMR designs is the same size as an EC6. 
<laughs> so, Physical size. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's this? Wow. About the modularity of Gandu reactors, that's interesting, uh, especially uh, in respect to uh, refurbishment, because I remember uh, before I retired, this was probably sometime around 2005, maybe 2006, I remember um, Bruce Power was looking at doing refurbishment a different way. Because this is business of replacing the individual pressure uses a hell of a job. And at that time, I remember seeing uh, <coughs> CAD simulations by Bruce Power. This, this was all going around AECL because we were all connected, you know, uh, internal networks and all that. So there were these uh, uh, CAD simulations that Bruce Power came up with of replacing the entire Calandria pressure tubes and all in one shot and storing it in a building next door and bringing in a complete Calandria with all pressure tubes installed and sticking it in there. I mean, the idea was to avoid this bloody long job of replacing all the pressure tubes one by one. So, you know, modularity, okay, you can call it that, but uh, you could also say that replacing the whole core would be modular. That's interesting. That's fascinating, actually, because I, I remember um, uh, Terrestrial Energy talked about what the, what do they do after the, I forget how many years, seven years, 12 years, they, they have the, they leave them in the ground, and then they build a new one right next to it. And they leave that to let the, uh, I guess, the the, fusion, the fission products can die off and moderate and, and become less less harmful. Uh, decay, I guess is the word I was looking for. Um, and uh, so it's not that different, really. Uh, yes. It's, it's only actually, modular uh, to the point. Uh, quite a few of these new uh, SMR startups are doing uh, exactly the same type of thing. Torcon as well, you know, on their barge-based reactor, they plan to have two units yes. operating and then uh, and mm -hmm. next to it uh, have two slots for when the when the reactors, the operating reactors, when they run out of their operating lot, they stick them in there and put new ones in. And, and the old ones, they, they cool off until, you know, they're significantly less radioactive to be able to transport them back to the factory. Right, for, for decommissioning or whatever, uh, to get the fission products out of it. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah. On that Bruce Power thing, I know that there's they did end up with a, some sort of special machine that makes the process a lot quicker, because um, I've seen pictures of it which is part of the reason Unit 6 was able to be done so quickly. I was wondering what... Yeah, you saw you saw it's done, eh? They're, they're in the startup process again, as far as getting it ready for startup. The refurbishment yeah, yeah. is done. Yep. Um, yeah, they're talking about refueling it right now, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not very familiar with how, what they do in their... Bruce Power, what they do in their retubing. I was more familiar with what was planned for John C2, uh, which never happened. We, we had, you know, complete uh, process uh, design for, for how that would be done. There was going to be a machine that uh, chewed up the pressure tubes into little two-inch squares, and uh, those would be all packed into uh, uh, buckets and stored in concrete silos for, you know, radioactive waste. So this was all planned out. Uh, I'm not sure what, what exactly Bruce Power is doing. I, I don't think they're chewing up the, the, the old pressure tubes. I think they're removing them whole. I think everything's in a warehouse. They, uh, they have all of the steam generators yeah. in a warehouse. And I think if you've got yeah. steam generators, which are absolutely massive you're not too concerned about the pressure tips. and not that radioactive i was just thinking you know talking about uh, those little reactor cores you know the modular reactors and you let them uh, some of the radioactivity decay before you throw them on a truck and take them back to the factory bruce can't even get the steam generators off site they're gonna ship them out and have them recycled right because the reactivity is so low and it's just the problem with 
uh, radioactivity is everybody has this fear of this invisible menace and it doesn't matter if it's the size of a flea you know yeah. it's you know you think that it's a lion right that's going to pounce on you and it's a stupid yeah. little flea right yeah yeah and, and, they, and they just have this irrational fear of it oh then you got coal plants dumping radioactivity into the, the... <laughs> what were you saying here i didn't quite catch that uh, the Bruce steam generators were originally planned to be shipped uh, to Sweden to a, a specialist company yep. named Studswick, who, who's been doing this for decades. They, they take old steam generators and they decontaminate them so that the steel can be reused and so on. That's what plan, uh, Bruce Power was uh, planning to do. Uh, but then uh, um, CNSC actually gave them the permit to do it. But there was so much opposition from uh, various groups along the St. Lawrence River where it would have to be shipped that uh, Bruce Power decided, no, we're not going to do it because everybody doesn't agree. So this is kind of silly, but that's what happens. Uh, and that's why those steam generators are still mm -hmm. sitting in warehouses at the site. So those are useful steam generators, like if they were written uh they're good they're good for recycled steel <laughs> well metals <laughs> right but exactly that's where the nuclear industry is self-defeating because that sends a message that oh yeah these people were right this stuff was dangerous we shouldn't be moving it you just got to keep pushing and say you know what yeah somebody tell us not to do it for for a nuclear operator to say yeah we're not going to do it now because you guys are right in essence is what they're saying it just wasn't the thing to do it, somebody else should have ordered them not to do it right Great. which probably would have happened but still it's it's the whole perception of the thing it's totally safe folks really it is well i don't believe you you're not going to do it right somebody else makes that decision interesting you can cut that out by the way <laughs> um, i don't want to talk like this on this i could if you want me to i will yeah <laughs> um but uh, I doesn't matter. Uh, I doesn't matter. I'm I'm old enough to be cynical now. <laughs> That's right. Um, I, on to another topic, and like every nuclear advocate likes to think of ways that, like we're always finding new ways that nuclear plants can be used, and uh, it's always fascinating to think that you can have these hybrid reactors where you can do more than one task not just create electricity but do other things and like diablo canyon produces desalination and um our reactors produce isotopes for medical reasons and um and i'm sure there's a bunch of others that have uh i think in in europe they have uh some of the the heat is for district heating some of it is for pulp and paper mills apparently they use some of that heat and uh what about the can do uh, besides we, did all right. we know we got we know <laughs> we already did that yeah the bruce energy center uh tell, yeah. tell, tell me more well the, well the bruce energy center uh, i mentioned they ran the heavy water plant off the process steam coming out of bruce a but they also did district heating. They heated the entire site with spare steam from Bruce. I didn't know that. Uh, they ran greenhouses. Um, there are a whole pile of other things, if, uh, but it, it eventually got killed during the uh, um, that era in the in the '90s where we were following the path of Emery Lovins and you know. Uh, Wasn't there a fish, small, uh, fish beautiful? Uh, probably that yeah, there were there was a ton of, of activity there but bruce a got shut down so yeah. what was the emory lovin's influence what was the negative aspect the soft path the soft path stuff you know oh we just need to do degrowth we don't need all this energy and then ontario hydro's um it was uh what's his face um Maurice. Uh, Maurice, Strong. Maurice. Maurice Strong. Maurice Strong. Really? He slashed the funding for Ontario Hydro and shut down Pickering A and Bruce Bruce A and ran the whole so thing. It was largely a philo philosophical difference then. Yeah, yeah. Philosophical. Absolutely. I mean, we went from uh, Ontario Hydro's 
you know, the, the goal of uh, Sir Adam Beck, you know, abundant hydro or abundant electricity at cost, right? Which is the foundation of modern society to this idea that we, that society was too big and we had to shrink everything and we had to, you know, curtail our, our use of resources and, you know, all live like love and, um, and yeah, that hosed Ontario Hydro. So fascinating, but yeah, so we did do all of that stuff at Bruce. We just stopped yeah. doing it when, when that. So happened. we're kind of like old hippies, but <laughs> no, I mean we are. <laughs> but you got to remember, though, um, Rick, is um, there's several ways that you can multi-purpose a nuclear plant. You know, you could have it feeding a bunch of batteries if there's a surplus. And I think Bruce actually does have batteries there now, or they plan to install some batteries in there on site so they can avoid some of the steaming process. But you can use the steam directly, which was what we were just talking about, or the district heating. Yeah. But then there's different um, qualities of steam that you require for different processes. You know, most industrial processes require steam that's so much hotter than what a can-do produces, or a nuclear unit for that matter, even the other ones. Um, you know, that's why you have some of these specialized uh, um, SMRs, they're talking about the high temperature process heat. Um, so, and the other way you can repurpose it or, or multitask it is, like I just said, a battery on site, but that battery on site is no different than the battery in downtown Toronto that Bruce feeds through the transmission system, right? It just happens to be geographically close to there. And now you have the thing where Nine Mile Point in, in New York is producing hydrogen on site. Well, it's a one megawatt electrolyzer, right? They're taking a megawatt from the plant output <laughs> and using it locally and on the electrolyzer and everybody thinks this is fantastic in the meantime that one megawatt could have backed off a megawatt of gas generation in new york so what are you really doing with it here you know when when you think about a dispatcher in a dispatcher's mind you always have to think where's the next megawatt coming from and uh if you take this megawatt away what do you do to replace it right and like in new york it's a gas generator down in new york city that came up an extra megawatt to run that electrolyzer at nine mile point it's not being run by nuclear electrolyzer meaning but, it produces hydrogen is that what you're saying yeah oh okay. yeah and what do they do with the hydrogen and i don't know oh, okay that's the thing, so. I I had an idea back in the 90s when we were doing all the maneuvering was that we should build a hydrogen plant right next door to Lennox and run the electrolyzers overnight because it's right on Lake Ontario, produce a whole bunch of hydrogen. And you, during the day when you need some peak generation, you run the Lennox units and hydrogen over peak during the day. You know, but that's with excess. So oh, yeah, you're excess. taking that away where you can use it somewhere else. You got to think to yourself, okay, I've taken it away from that use. What's the actual impact of doing this, right? <laughs> so the can-do bottom line is, um, I, I had a fellow tell me uh, tell me this a long time ago, and, and I sort of had it uh, co corroborated on on Twitter. Is they run like wet soup. Their, their steam is like just just uh, just soup, right? Because it's not high pressure steam, it's low temperature, low pressure steam. That's why these generators have three massive low pressure turbines to get the energy out of the steam. So what's your point? Which is bigger than a normal high pressure I'm not sure, generator. I'm not sure I get the analogy. Soup is good or bad? Well, if you want to use it for industrial processes, it's bad. Oh, I see. Okay. Because it's not hot enough, well, yeah. right? It's just soup. It's not boiling water. It's just soup. <laughs> it's less right? than boiling. I see what you're saying. But it's ready to. But I have the concept, and of course, people wouldn't wouldn't like that. Is um, if you really need a lot of it, you build a hybrid plant which is a nuclear provides the feed steam to a fossil process that takes it up the last little bit of temperature and pressure that you need for the process. You can build hybrids like that. And actually in the 50s, I think there was a plant or two where there was actually a fossil unit linked with a nuclear unit so the, to do this if, kind of thing. I mean, in some obscure way, hydrogen is fossil in the sense that it's burned. So what, I mean, is there the idea that you don't have to transport it makes it more appealing but what about the actual burning of hydrogen is that a good source of energy it's not really fossil 
It's not fossil because it's not fossil. It's, fossil energy is carbon. something you dug out of the ground. No, I, I meant that, that. I meant in the sense that it's it, burned. Um, well, it's burned, but it burns clean, right? Absolutely, that's why it's good. But my point is, is yeah. that um, is it an efficient burner? Does it, does it produce enough electricity? No. It's the worst energy storage system of anything. That's really what you're doing, is you're using it as for energy storage. <laughs> The losses in that that process of turning it back around, I, I don't know the exact numbers. It's probably under a 25% return, maybe even under 20%. Yeah, right? Whereas really a battery really gives you 85%, a good pump storage will give you 75 to 80%. Um, if you have like what we have here in Ontario, which is a hybrid pump storage at Beck, we have a pump storage plant that takes water out of the canal that feeds the generating station right there. You're actually pumping that little bit of energy into the lake, but you're also reducing the main plant that much more. And like the, the pump cycle for the PGS at, at Beck, because it's a hybrid between the actual pump storage plant and the generating plant was upwards of 90 to 95% efficiency on that. You know what? Like it's really you know, great. I it still boggles my mind that it doesn't get used. I, I don't understand it. It's a market thing. You know, I don't understand. You know, you could. Uh, um, I'm not a hydrogen fa fan myself, but uh, just to be sure, hydrogen can be used in fuel cells, which are quite efficient. So uh, you know, it depends. You don't necessarily have to burn it. You can we can run it through fuel cells. Okay, and that's interesting. And, and if the fuel cell is not in a car, is that useful? Like a fuel cell used in a different way for other purposes. Um, is that practical? Sure. Pardon me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I guess what I'm, I, I just wanted to settle the argument that net, uh, that hydrogen leaks and, and mixes into the atmosphere. And if it mixes with, uh, if it mixes with methane, uh, the methane stays in the atmosphere longer. Uh, have you heard that one? That's that's news to me. I uh, found that from a guy, a guy in Ontario. Yeah, I, His name is Paul Martin, and he's a hydrogen specialist. And he said, if, uh -huh. if when you when the hydrogen leaks into the atmosphere, it'll mix with the existing methane, and the methane becomes even worse than it was in the first place, and it's it lasts an extra thirty or forty years in the atmosphere, and um, uh, so in a, he, he's saying that hydrogen, when it leaks, is like a meth, is, is like a fossil, like a fossil fuel in that sense, uh, because it, it causes the other um, greenhouse gases to last even longer. Had you heard that one? Is that news, news to you guys? Oh, I think there must be some misunderstanding because it doesn't work that way. Hydrogen does not react with methane. Really? This guy is a supposed to call himself a specialist. Um, he has a company called Spitfire Research. And uh, we should look that up and maybe talk about it another day. But uh, it's it's fascinating, the idea that you could use sin fuels. So you could take hydrogen to create sin fuel, too. Um, oh, yeah. So, like, if you, oh, yeah. if you need, you want to improve on your uh, diesel engines, uh, where you don't have emit as much carbon, your sin fuel can be used. So hydrogen can be a good uh, feed of um, source for for that. Well, natural gas is used for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, my my point was simply that look at it this way: methane is CH four, right. hydrogen is H two. You cannot react those two together because there is no such thing as CH5 or CH6. It just doesn't work. <laughs> I wonder what he's... There must be something else in his argument that I missed. We'll have to talk about that another time. But, um, okay, well, um, I think we had quite a good discussion. Uh, I think we're, we're at the point where we start wrapping up. It's about a, an hour and 45 minutes almost now. Um, so uh, let's see if there's any... Uh, some of the things we might have left untouched. Um, well, just uh, to get back to Tom's one point yeah. there that he just he mentioned pumped storage and he mentioned storage at Bruce. Uh, the Meaford project, 
which is now called Ontario Pump Storage, um, and still hasn't started construction. But that was Bruce's answer to dumping steam overnight. To, uh-huh. They were trying to get away from curtailing. Um, and in the immediate future, if we do refurbish Pickering B, which it looks like almost definitely going to happen at this point, we will have overnight surpluses. It, it's just, it's going to happen. We're going to have more reliable units with less downtime. So we're going to have more surplus capacity. Um, so using that surplus to pump water out of Georgian Bay and then using it to offset some peaking capacity during the day, I think does make sense. It's mm-hmm. the economics of it uh, that may not. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that our public knows what pump storage is. So you're talking about taking water from a lake and somehow storing it somewhere. Yeah, the, the plan is to build a huge reservoir above Georgian Bay and then pump water out of Georgian Bay into it during the night and then use it to, to displace peaking gas during the day. That's Nero and Sound, isn't it? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Meaford. Yeah, Meaford. It's pretty harmless. I mean, you build a, a storage tank, it's not very... Um, it's very big. It's big, but potentially dangerous, I suppose. Yeah, uh, limited. I mean, there's Raccoon Mountain in the States, which is absolutely massive, and it's much larger than, than Meaford. I think that's dangerous. Uh, a TVA project. Pardon, Tom? They're not dangerous. Because they're controlled. You'd think, you'd, think, you'd think people who are against it think it's the end of the world, but I saw the and plans for this Meaford pump storage. And, you know, getting back to, like, uh, the, the discharge water diffusers for Darlington, it makes them look pretty chintzy compared to what they were going to do at this pump storage where they have the diffusers down in the lake. It won't even suck a fish into it. That's, that's how diffused <laughs> it's going to be, right? And it's, we're talking a 1,000 megawatt pump. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the flow is going to be so low that not even a fish is going to be captured by it. Wow. So they've they've got the stuff figured out pretty good. Yeah, Just getting back to the hydrogen, uh, Gerald. Hydrogen fuel cells are forty to sixty percent efficient, which is pretty well the same as as a gas turbine, whether it's natural gas or a hydrogen turbine, and the the uh, the most of efficient electrolyzers are about seventy five percent. So you take 40 to 60 percent of 75 percent and you can see where the numbers are they're down well i might have been a little bit low with the 20 percent but probably closer with 25 maybe 30 percent then who knows still very inefficient so yeah. very Especially poor storage mechanism storage. so you're talking about eco- yeah. econ- economic yeah. economics again yeah energy in versus energy out yeah yeah it's it's a bit of a rube goldberg when you're comparing it to yeah. like pump storage but we just talked about which is you know 80 five percent efficient right right yeah uh and with regard to the um sin fuels um that might be a more practical use for hydrogen i I don't see hydrogen as being practical just because it has so much in the way of uh logistical challenges you know and you have you'd have consumers handling thousands of psi of an invisible gas that catches fire well uh it just seems very challenging the other thing is is the molecule is so tiny that it's prone to leaks uh, and then how do you solve this and nasa nasa knows this yeah. because they forever consistently have hydrogen leaks and now you're going to have this big pipeline that's going to go all over the place carrying hydrogen i mean when people are worried about natural gas pipelines pipelines they should be a hundred times more worried about having a hydrogen pipeline pass by their house because when it leaks it blows up real good well we're not, like not real none of us are, too. none of us are chemists but if we had to take <laughs> natural gas and and convert it somehow to a sin fuel yeah fish or drops wouldn't wouldn't you be releasing carbon yes yep and, uh, but they, they do that already. Shell, Shell does it uh, in, on a huge scale um, at their Pearl facility located in Kadar. Yeah. Uh, they produce base oils. They produce fuels. They produce all kinds of stuff. And ExxonMobil has some uh, gas processing facilities as well. They don't make lubricants out of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, yeah, that, that process already exists. Uh, it was pioneered by the, the Fisher, Germans. Fisher Trop. 
Yeah. Yeah. Where they was, it was a German process. They used, uh, they did it for coal gasification actually at the time mm. um, because of the, the fuel supply issues during World War II. But uh, they also made lubricants with it. But uh, yeah, the process exists. You could pair it with carbon capture, I suppose, uh, to try to eliminate that carbon footprint. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how efficient it was. So I guess what I was getting at is I, I, I've done a bit of research. Now, sometimes doing research is dangerous because I don't know what I'm talking about. But um, uh, <laughs> I, I know enough to be dangerous, I suppose. Um, but uh, the idea that uh, hydrogen can be uh, somehow combined with natural gas in a way that doesn't release carbon. And that's, I think that's uh, why I mentioned that. I, I think I, I might still... Well, they've been using that in like, so GE has a, a process uh, or they have uh, hydrogen certified turbines, um, which are supposed to be able to run on a blend right. uh, of hydrogen and natural gas. Uh, but the efficiency curve, like the, you don't, you, you know, you put mix in 5% hydrogen, uh, the efficiency is, is lower than if you were just running out on straight natural gas yeah. uh, and the emissions reduction is not there. Um, I mean, that's, and there's, the, there's, it's a greenwash, I guess is my point. There was that Greenpeace uh, spawn where they were selling, what was it, wind green gas or something like that. And it was just <laughs> natural gas with 5% hydrogen. Yeah. Like, and they're trying to send hydrogen to... Um, hydrogen to germany weren't they canada oh yeah but it was it was a greenwash because it was like up to five percent hydrogen content the rest of it was just straight methane. explain that greenwash term a little bit it sounds like it's yeah it's, it's it makes it look like it's environmentally friendly when it's oh, okay, yeah. in no way more environmentally friendly than this running the straight methane in the first place because the hydrogen content lowered the btu and the fuel does, so you're just burning more but of they it. haven't dropped that that's still part of the plan isn't it I don't know, but it was Greenpeace was selling it. They were affiliated with the organization, and they were they were selling it as this, you know, green hydrogen crap. But it really wasn't. It was mostly almost entirely methane. And in fact, they they had uh, issues with hydrogen supply. So the vast majority of the time, they were just selling you methane at a premium. So, but converting, um, but it's green because it says green. But there was the other thing that maybe I'm getting it mixed up. But there was also Canada was proposing that we we use wind and solar to create hydrogen. And then, oh, that's in Newfoundland, and that's not Canada proposing it. That was uh, Germany wanted the hydrogen from Canada, and there was a company willing to set up shop off the coast of Newfoundland and build wind turbines uh, that were then so, that are then supposed to. Um, produce hydrogen for export to Germany. So we're going to put hydrogen in ships and we're going to ship it across the Atlantic to Germany. Economically. This is going to be economically viable. I don't think so. This, this sounds like a major boondoggle in the making. Yeah. Um, you know, if the Green Energy Act is any indication, mm -hmm. you know, the government can really, really screw these things up. And Newfoundland doesn't have any money in the first place. So it's just well, they already have very expensive electricity there. They got to get, they got to make that money back somehow. <laughs> well, I mean, they were, they're already dealing with like, I mean, not I'm not to crap on Newfoundland, like they, they've got muskrat falls, which the feds had to bail them out of, which means you know us in Ontario here are paying for their hydroelectric project. Yeah. Um, so you know, embarking on this it sounds like an even bigger boondoggle because we know how to do hydro, yeah. right? And that still got screwed up. Mm -hmm. So you can just imagine, you know, using wind turbines to intermittently produce hydrogen that we're going to ship across the Atlantic. You know, the economics are just horrific. They should have shipped um, Tom Hesso to Newfoundland. <laughs> they should have. <laughs> anyway, Tom, that's a little. I, I uh, telecommuted there. <laughs> okay. I uh, I wrote a number of their documents, their operating documents for all that stuff. <laughs> for Muskrat Falls? Well, the, all their system changes. Oh, okay. That, the Maritime Link, the Labrador Island Link, Restoration Muskrat Plan. Falls is working now, finally. Restoration Plan, too. Mm. 
Yeah, but like I know, I know a lot more about it than I can say. So, <laughs> oh, okay. I saw you, but I mean, I saw you looking in the distance. Like, what should I say? What shouldn't I say? <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Well, I was, I was actually no, I was actually looking up another document that I just came across. Was oh here, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro two two thousand and twenty three application for the abandonment of the hydrogen system portion of the Ramia Wind Hydrogen Diesel Generation Project. Oh, they abandoned. Oh, I didn't know anything about this. They had some island. They were they were looking to put in wind generators in there, diesel, and they wanted to put a hydrogen plant in there with it. Now they want to abandon the hydrogen part because it just doesn't work. Which raises an interesting point. Uh, I wanted to mention some of these, some of these Canadian things that are misconceptions. Like Prince Edward Island, for example, gets a lot of its power from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. New Brunswick. That's what I meant. Uh, because they have the hyd they they have the nuclear plant, right? So, well, funny thing is, back in the 80s, PEI didn't want anything to do with nuclear energy, so they put nuclear energy filters on the lines going to the islands to keep it off the island. Well, that's that's just a fun term, but but it's, it was nuclear but power. Still they just didn't want to admit it that they were getting energy from the nuclear plant, right? Because they were anti-nuclear. Well, yeah, Ooh. it's yeah. it's amazing, but the, but they still get that energy from New Brunswick, right? Yeah. Well, it's a mix, right? Um, you have an operating area and they have a whole bunch of generators and all the electrons go into the big pool and get taken out of the pool. Who gets what? Well, they brag whatever you're much, closest to. They brag about how much wind they have, but they, they kind of fail to give credit to nuclear. You well, it's not nuclear directly. It's energy from New Brunswick. Indirect. They have hydroelectric too. They've got the Beldoon coal plant, you know, which is running... Yeah. Still. So it's it's well if you wanna if you, if you wanna talk about it, it's a blend. Well yeah, but you know energy reality, remember that word? <laughs> yeah. I mean that's where I guess what I'm getting at is that you can't keep pretending when you have um when you know what works and what is and what's happening. Like um Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess that's a wake-up call. Like, if anyone's watching this show, <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, so we're get, we're starting to wrap up. Uh, any, I guess we'll go. We'll start with uh, uh, Tom. Anything you want to say to come to finish? Uh, any comments before we go? Well, in your notes, you had one thing about the can-do. Uh, units is what the steam temperatures were and I had looked them up oh yeah and this is for a can do six but I think it applies to Bruce and Darlington as well Pickering was 500 and no not 500 297 degrees C is the uh, the uh, the steam coming out of the reactor okay or the heavy water sorry the 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 heat transport sure um, can do six and, and the Bruce and Darlington they run at 310 degrees Celsius and then that goes through the steam generator and the steam that gets sent out to the the turbines which is light water mm -hmm. demineralized light water just like a normal conventional plant mm -hmm. um, is 260 degrees C and the pressure on it I didn't write that down but it's about the temperature and pressure are well below what you have in like a conventional fossil plant right so the process you know, and that's what makes it is limited that's what makes it unusable for processing yeah, for yeah. industrial uses um yeah. and uh i don't know if anyone's studied about the arc furnace and whether or not electro electric electricity can be a benefit for process heat that way is that a waste of energy or is that practical no, there's been um, DeFasco, when it was still DeFasco back in the day, was a big proponent on uh, the Ontario electricity market because they were a buyer of electricity to run their arc furnace uh -huh. in Hamilton. The only problem with an arc furnace is because they got the thermal brick that surrounds it, you can't let it cool off. It's designed for that brick to hold. It's got to retain its heat, so the power can never go off, right? And the other thing that arc furnaces do is cause a lot of electrical flicker because they're actually arcing, so the voltage is fluctuating. Oh. 
And uh, I lived in Cambridge back, um, well, when did I move out of there? Like 2005. But there was a small steel making company in, in Cambridge. And when they ran their little arc furnace, the lights flickered all the time. And you'd notice it with the incandescent bulbs. Now with LEDs, you don't. But um, you'd see that flicker all the time. It would just drive me nuts. So I just need Nicole so, to come back. So it's just direct electrical use. I don't know what the thermal efficiency is, but you'd think it would be better than running fossil, like heating it with coal and stuff, mm -hmm. because there are your energy losses with the with the exhaust coming out of there. So I think it's better. But then the input, you, you got to look at that, whether it's a natural gas generator, which is only 60% efficiency with its natural gas going in and coming out as electricity. <laughs> So, you know, you've got all those facts. You make a very good yeah. point. The arc furnace needs to run 24-7. Yeah, all those steel-making furnaces do. It wasn't just the, the arc furnace. Okay, yeah. but it, The problem was, I think, if they had an outage for more than eight hours, it was uh, the thing could potentially collapse in on itself, right? Oh. Which was a consideration for feeding it with electricity. You know, and the other ones, uh, the coke furnaces, well, you just feed it more coke, right? It's not dependent on the electric electrical system to keep its heat going. So that was an interesting consideration for those. Okay. So that's, thanks for bringing that up. Um, okay, uh, uh, Yarrow, any th closing remarks? Uh, I, not really, uh, unless there's a question or something. Did we miss something? Yeah. I, have you enjoyed this? I, I see you smiling a lot. Was, I got the impression that this is uh, kind of refreshing to have this l level of depth in a conversation about uh, nuclear, because what doesn't often happen where you pe have people willing to discuss the deeper details about reactors, right? Um, oh at least. yeah, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned the Canadians for nuclear energy, right? Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Uh, I I do participate in the in the Facebook group, but uh, not really okay. otherwise. Uh, okay. I guess I'm missing something. Okay. Yeah. There's a WhatsApp group, and um, uh, if you're ever interested in learning WhatsApp and getting it on your cell phone. It's worth uh, joining us. Oh, geez, uh, Chris Keith has been bugging me to get uh, to get WhatsApp on my uh, on my computer forever. Uh, oh, I by the way, make little steps. I can give you a hint. Uh, the Opera um, Opera is a, a browser, right? And it has a built-in uh, WhatsApp. Uh, uh, all you need to do is use your. Um, uh, cell phone to to with the um, what do they call those symbols those uh, special the barcode. barcodes yeah whatever and um, and you read it and it, it it connects everything so it's pretty cool but uh, one day we'll, we'll talk okay, about that all right uh, okay. and Chris what, what do you have for a closer anything the immortal can do <laughs> so that that was another one of Mark Nelson's points that's um, after that. <laughs> Yeah. So the, the the thing, you know, eventually your pressure vessel does wear out, right? So that kills your unit. You're done. That's it. You can replace the pressure tubes multiple times. <laughs> so, and I think I'm not 100% sure, right? I, I can't predict the future, but I, I do think that we will see pressure tubes being replaced at Bruce units one and two again. I think they'll be refurbished a second time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because they're going to be think... out of step. I'm just no? keep going. Oh, it's, it's gonna, they're going to be out of step with the rest of the plant. So I think you'll see a subsequent refurbishment of those two units. Uh, and that opens the door for doing Darlington as well. So, uh, so the steam generators that are sitting there that need to be thrown out are recycled, whatever. Um, that's one of the things that you would replace to make it immortal. Yeah, I mean, those are those are modules, right? You can replace yeah. them. Uh, I, they, they may not need being replaced when the pressure tubes need to be replaced again. Uh, the updated boiler should last longer, um, and they've got a better handle on keeping contamination out of the boilers and uh, extending their lives. So yeah. uh, a lot has improved 
in both their manufacture and maintenance uh, since those ones that have now been removed and, and replaced have been installed. Um, so I guess we'll see. Uh, those units are supposed to be end of life, like 2045. Um, they, they probably so won't at the end of life of a, of a pressure tube, where does it go? Well, I think at Bruce, they just go in the same warehouse as, <laughs> as the steam generators at this point. Eventually, some turtle is going to get one of those up its nose, and they're going to have to do something with it. <laughs> but not to a DGR? Am I, um, that's what I, would they go to a DGR? Actually, uh, no, they're not. Rick, yes. Yes, those uh, those pressure tubes uh, from Bruce uh, Refurb, they were supposed to go into on OPG's DGR at the site. You know, oh. the one that was uh, being uh, planned, uh, like, uh, what was that, around uh, 2015, uh, something yeah. like that. Okay. Uh, but that DGR was... That, yeah, that was the intermediate waste DGR, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that was never built, so I think they just sit in a warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> another another point to note with this eternal life for the can do is the calandria. Yep. It's not exposed to like the high temperatures or the high radioactivity. It's more or less just a pressure tube holder or fuel channel holder. Yep. And yeah, the moderator pressure. in the calandria runs at about seventy degrees C, so it's not even running hot. Oh wow. Yep. And it's so not pressurized. It's pretty cool. So they have a long life, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But how long does a stainless pot last? <laughs> yeah. Right. Good point. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Might as well just stay forever. So. So I like that. Okay. Well. Yep. Uh, okay, guys. So thanks very much. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, we're 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 bound to have some other future. Um, meeting we can find a reason i'm sure and uh and uh so i look forward to it and uh, i will keep you guys posted when i get this uh, pu published okay okay and I look forward to seeing uh both of you guys at uh at bruce all right right good stuff yep okay is it too late for yaro to get in on that or maybe he doesn't want to <laughs> anyway no, I don't think it's too late. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll catch you later. So have a good uh, good day, and uh, we'll okay. be in touch soon. All right, guys. Okay, bye. All right. Bye. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye.